Hi and welcome or welcome back to my channel. I'm Simon and today I am back with my frankly very bloody belated January reading wrap up. A chat about all the books that I read in January and I'm doing something a little bit different with wrap ups this year and that's not the late thing because I'm hoping that February's will be pretty much at the beginning of March. I cannot believe it's March next week. I mean, that does show how bloody belated this is. But anyway, I want to do a couple of different things. One is that as we go through the year, I'm going to be letting you know the books that I DNF, be they DNFs forever or DNFs for now, which I haven't really done in previous years, I don't think. And then also at the end of wrap-up videos, there'll be something new that I'm going to tease you with for now so that you make sure you stay until the end and I will say January was a very good reading month I really kind of got into my groove early on in the year which is hopefully a good sign of things to come as is that was an unintentional yet perfect segue <laughs> hopefully a sign of good things to come is the first book I read in January which is also the first book that I read in 2024 and I'm very suspicious suspicious very superstitious about the first book that I read each year and the one I picked was Dazzling by Chickadilly Emelu Madu and this is set in Nigeria where we meet two young women. We have Ozzy Omena who is descended from a long line of men who can turn into tigers as she discovers quite early on in the book. However she is the first female in the family to do so and we also meet Treasure whose father has died quite recently and she one day at the market makes a bargain with a quite dodgy, let's be honest, spirit who says he will bring her father back if she does certain things for him. And so we follow these two stories and as the book goes on we slowly see that they interweave. This is a real patchwork of a book in terms of you've got these two different storylines that are sort of running alongside each other but also kind of aren't. They go back and forth occasionally and that occasionally I found slightly confusing and just had to get back a little bit but I thought the writing in this was brilliant. I loved all of the folklore and the magic that was interwoven into this. I thought that was fantastic. It has this dark glint. In fact there's some really dark stuff that happens as the book goes on and it's very much about what the expectation is on young women in Nigeria and how they are sometimes fighting against it in a positive way and sometimes battling against it in quite a negative way. And I thought the way, again, that those two things were done or those two themes or those sort of mirror images, I guess, were done and how society and what it expects from us all kind of places upon us can lead us into very different directions in our lives. I mean, the cover is just next level and I think it's out in paperback either now or very very soon so really 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 recommend that. Then I headed to a book that I meant to read all last year and never got round to and that's Brother and Sister Enter the Forest by Richard Mirabella. Quite a few people have recommended me this book. I'd already got it imported because it's not out in the UK although I would love it to be. There's quite a few books that I've read in the last year that aren't out here that I really really think should be. Anyway what's this about? Good question, thank you for asking and keeping me on track. This is about Justin who one day turns up on his sister Willa's door after having vanished in essence for quite a long time. They've had quite a tricky relationship and we go backwards to see what happened and look at their childhood together. Their very complex mother and the complex relationship that they both have with her in very different ways but also about an incident that happened to Justin when he was young and that changed all of their lives forever. And I don't really want to say more than that. I will say, and don't let this put you off if you didn't like this book, there was kind of occasionally a little life vibes to this in, the terms, in terms of how it looks at trauma, in terms of how it looks at sexuality, in terms of how it looks at the breakdown of relationships because you miscommunicate or you you can't, well in Justin's case, he's almost keeping secrets within himself, from himself, so how can he therefore share what's going on with anyone else? I loved how it did that. I thought the writing was fantastic. It's really propulsive. It's not as uh, graphic or as relentless, I would say, as A Little Life. And again, like I said, if you 
Don't Love a Little Life. I personally think A Little Life is an amazing book, but that's for a whole different conversation that I don't think we've ever really had on this channel, but maybe we will at some point, who knows? Breathe. I really thought this was a phenomenal debut and I can't wait to see what Richard Mirabella writes next. I also really, really, really love this cover. I'm trying really hard on Instagram to match the background to the cover of books. It's blinking hard, you know, and there have been several times this year where I've sort of just stopped and or just deleted loads of stuff because I just think, why, who cares? Why is anyone bothered? But I will get better at it because I do, I love Instagram. It's probably my favourite social media after YouTube. So yeah, I would highly, highly, highly recommend this if you can get your mitts on it. I don't know, I haven't done stars before. Do you want them? I'm going to try it. And if you want me to keep doing them in videos, I will go forward. I would say this is like a solid 3.5 slash 4 star. This was very much a 4.5 star. And then my first 5 star of the year was I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Hartman. And yes, I said first 5 star because they're well, keep watching. This is utterly phenomenal. I've done a whole video on it separately, so I won't go on about it too much, but it starts off in kind of this underground bunker where there are a group of women who have been kept in a cage. They're roughly around the same age, except for one who is a fair bit younger. And there's a bit of a question mark about how, I mean, there's a massive question mark about how these women have ended up in a cage and what the heck is going on outside the cage in the world if it still exists like there's a lot and it's brilliant but also there's this question about how did this younger woman end up in this cage with them we follow in the first part of the book how they have come to kind of create a life in there they are watched over they have wardens but they aren't ever well they're basically left alone apart from given food and watched over and it's how they have come to get used to a life that they suddenly realise isn't going quite in tandem with the world as they knew it, as well as the fact that what on earth happened to the world as they knew it. And I don't want to give too much more away. If you've read it and you want spoilers, it's in that video, which I'll link down below. But also I let you know where there's going to be spoilers when I talk about it in more depth. But yeah, this absolutely bowled me over. I thought the writing was absolutely phenomenal. The translation, I should say, by... They should do this better where they put it on Rose Schwartz. Ros Schwartz? Rose Schwartz? Ros Schwartz. So anyway, I thought the translation was seamless. I thought the amount of themes within here and the layers just brilliant. And also the fact that this book continually asks questions and continually takes you in directions that you can't predict, I thought was masterfully done because at no point did I get annoyed by it or a bit frustrated, which in the hands of maybe a different author, I easily could have. So yeah, I thought this was absolutely, I'm going to say it, amazing. But then sadly, my least favourite book of January that said, I would still give this like a three out of five, so that's pretty decent. It's O Caledonia by Elspeth Barker, which has an introduction by Maggie O'Farrell because this is a sort of forgotten Scottish modern classic. And this is all about a young woman called Janet who when the book opens, we know will be found dead at the bottom of a flight of stairs around her 16th birthday. What we don't know is why and so we then go back to pretty much Janet's birth and how she's quite a ostracised child. Her parents feel she's quite different from her siblings before and certainly her siblings after and she kind of becomes this sort of shadow within the household and the household is a really big part of this book and it changes quite a bit throughout but they end up in this huge grand crumbly old manor in the Scottish Highlands which is just like atmospheric wise, gothic wise, just my kind of thing. I think what I didn't, I think what I didn't like, I know what I didn't like, was that Janet goes from being this victim to I actually felt like bullied character by the author. There were a few initial kind of funny moments or there'd be moments where I left and I thought, actually, that's really cruel. I couldn't understand why. I guess it's about feeling isolated and lonely within a family. Isolation is a big theme in terms of where they are and the fact that this family are kind of ostracised because they're all a little bit wacky, quacky, wacky, whatever the term is. Wacky and quacky, let's go with that. It started to bother me and I started to just, well, feel for Janet, which is a really good sign that the book was doing what it was doing well but also at the same time start to think, just stop now, like enough, even though I knew she was gonna die, which is kind of, you know, well, literally the be all and end all of the book. Um, 
and I had questions around the ending too, actually. Oh, and that's the other thing. She gets a jackdaw, and I was all really excited about this jackdaw, and then that happens, like, literally at the end, and that was the reason that I got the imported edition, because I think that cover's so good and looks so gothic, and it just didn't quite deliver on all those things like I wanted it to. Loads of people love it, including Ali Smith and Maggie Farrell, so what do I know? I read that, I should say, on the way to and in Edinburgh, which I have vlogged about both in terms of going book shopping in Edinburgh and inviting you along with me, but also my first reading journal, which is the series of reading vlogs that I've started this year and hope to carry on until well whenever was filmed when I was in Edinburgh and I decided that I wanted a kind of Scottish theme and After You'd Gone is Maggie O'Farrell's debut novel and this starts in Waverley train station which is Edinburgh's train station I thought oh that's perfect and I started it and I don't know if this has happened to you before because this was a DNF but not a DNF forever certainly just a DNF for now because it's going to be the Patreon book club pick for next month, for my Patreon book club, I should say. The reason for that is it's a really creepy opener and I was definitely invested, but I just really, really wanted it to be a book that I read with someone or a group of people to talk about because it gave that vibe from the beginning. Have you ever had any books like that? And if so, let me know in the comments down below because they could be future book club picks. I'll be talking about this in my March wrap up, which will be here sooner than you can imagine because this one's been so blinking late. The next book that I read, this on any given day is a 4.5 going into five star book for me. And it's a book that I don't know if we're kind of all over the whole if you loved Saltburn, the movie, then you're gonna love this book. And I've seen so many recommendations, this has never come up, but when I was reading this, not only was it very Saltburn in vibe for me, it had a real Mean Girls about it, also a hint of the craft. I know that's a lot of movies that I've just mentioned, but it is a corking book. And this is set in Edinburgh, and I bought it in Portobello Bookshop. And it had a snake on the cover, which was the Savage Reading Prompt for January. If you don't know what a Savage Reading Prompt is, they are 13 prompts that me and my mum picked out of a jar. It's just there. That lots of you lovely lot had suggested, and we read to them each month, but you can read them in whatever order you want, whatever months you want, how many in one month, you know, spread them out however you like. Anyway, for January, I had bought a book already, or pre-ordered one, that arrived while I was away, uh, with a snake on the cover that was unintentional, which we'll talk about next, but the one I got, wow, I went on a right old detour then, the one I got in uh, Edinburgh was The Things We Do To Our Friends by Heather Darwin. And this has, again, very much like uh, After You'd Gone, the most brilliant, creepy, sinister prologue, which I won't say much about because, well, I just won't. And then we end up in Edinburgh, where we meet Claire. It's the first term of hers at Edinburgh University, and she wants to completely reinvent herself. And I think we've all had moments in our lives where we felt like that, where we've gone to a new school, or where we've started a new job, or moved to a new city, and just been like, do you know what, this is a chance to reinvent myself. So instantly you're on board with Claire. Within a few days she meets Tabitha, and Tabitha is part of this clique who are just sort of really popular, yet really quite isolated in a mysteriousness they're very tight-knit and they take Claire in slowly but surely and Claire's kind of thinking I'm chuffed that I've got these friends but also why do they want to be friends with me they've clearly got plans for a project they want to work on and how do they want me to be involved I can't quite understand it because there's little hints of that as as you go on but also what you realize as the reader is that Claire isn't telling the group everything about her either and she's certainly not telling you and I thought the way Heather Darwin did this with that sort of unreliable narrator but seeing it from all different angles in terms of the group being unreliable, Claire being unreliable to us, Claire being unreliable to them, I just thought it was done so brilliantly and what it looks at, actually I would also say there's hints of promising young woman as well. And if you've seen Saltburn but you haven't seen that, I do recommend it. I was completely hooked by it. I really didn't want to put it down when I was off doing lovely things around Edinburgh, which considering Edinburgh is one of my favourite cities, says a lot. If you've not read it, do read it. I think it's absolutely fantastic and just really full of surprises and shocks and my jaw genuinely dropped a few times so yeah I really 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 recommend this. The book that I had pre-ordered with a snake on the cover but not knowing at the time that I pre-ordered it 
we'll get there at some point, I promise, that that would be a prompt was Sean Hewitt's latest collection, Raptures Road. I loved Sean's previous collection. I loved his pamphlet before that. I've had the pleasure of having a wander around Dublin with Sean and he took me to Trinity College Library, which was amazing. He's a delight. His poems are wonderful. They're very sensual, occasionally quite sexual and brimming with nature, but they're also about loss, grief, love, abandonment and I thought this was really, really, really good. I don't know if I quite loved it as much as his first one, but I think it's probably not the best idea to try and compare someone's collections. Cause also I think there's that thing, isn't there? Like when you first read any author, I think this is true. You may disagree with me. Let me know in the comments down below. When you discover an author where their words, their prose, their verse, whatever really sings to you, there's nothing quite like the first time. So yeah, I thought this was brilliant and I loved everything that it looked at and would recommend it if you're after some queer, nature-filled, sensual poetry. So we have that. And to the next book that was a DNF that I also bought in Edinburgh, I bought this at Toppings & Co. And this again is not a DNF forever. It was just a DNF for now. It's Housewoman by Adora and Wara. And I was really, really excited for this um, and, and still am because I'm going to get back to it at some point after it was getting some comparisons to my sister, the serial killer, which I thought was brill. This is about a young woman who is basically brought up to be someone's wife and we follow her from Nigeria to America and we follow her as she meets her intended husband for the first time and the way the family welcome her and the things she has to go through before she can be his wife and I got like I don't know if you can see it actually um I got there we go that far in can you see that or is that cool? I'm overthinking it it doesn't matter I got a little way in basically they have sex and he's mentioned previously that he isn't the best with his own personal hygiene and then when they have sex it's brought up again and it literally made me do it and I think again that's intentional but it really put me off. I've had quite a bit of distance from it and I'm hoping to get back to it soon because the writing was great. From what I'd gathered there were going to be some really interesting themes, some really interesting insight into how these marriages are set up and how they work or don't as I think this may end up being but also I think how this woman has gone in with one character as kind of a she's almost in disguise she's hiding her true nature and I think the true nature will come out at some point wow I worded that really badly I'm intrigued to, to head back to it next up a short story collection and this I picked for Gayla's buzzword on prompt which was a book with there in the title and I chose out there by Kate Folk the book I'd wanted to get to after reading one of her short stories in my short story advent calendar back in December last year and I really really love that short story and I really like the short stories in here they're all a little bit and I know this is possibly a slightly lazy analogy they're all a bit black mirror-ish in the fact that some of them are quite dystopic some of them are happening now but there's sort of a otherness to them be it sci-fi be it a horror be it a little bit of magic and I enjoyed every single one. I'm not, when I look back, I'm not able to differentiate all of them. That is partly because there's a story, well, not a story, well, no, it is. The first story is about these sort of bots that are men out there that are basically the physical embodiment of bots on the internet. And when you go dating, you don't know whether you might actually end up with a bot or a real man and I thought that idea was fantastic. That story then comes back again later on and I think because of that and because even though every story has something very different and surprising and unique about it, the world in which they were set often felt very similar to the point where it could have been that it was the same characters over again apart from changing their names and I think that's where maybe there just needed to be a sprinkling of changing settings. I mean there was one and it reminded me actually of Kate Atkinson's short story that I loved last year where suddenly the world goes dark and if you're outside that's it whereas if you're inside you're Kate and it ends up that our narrator when it first happens is in Waitrose. There's a story like that where 
there is sort of the end of the world is following people and that was really spooky and sinister there's a great one about a shelter although i sort of predicted what the ending was going to be i would definitely read more of her work and this is a solid short story collection like there weren't any duds but it all felt a little bit despite the variety of the quirky elements a little bit sort of too similar I'm hard to please, aren't I? I would recommend it still if you're wanting to try some short stories and you want a solid collection. And also if you like Black Mirror or anything a little bit fantastical, then yeah, head to this one. Also, really, really, really lovely cover. I should also say this book I read when things were really, really, really stressful at work. So I don't think that helped. So maybe I should get back to it at another point. It was escapist, but I don't know. I think I was trying to read it like a novel maybe actually. So that's the fault of me, not the fault of the book. Anyway. The next novel that I read was Tess Gerritsen's The Spy Coast, and I read this during the second ridiculously busy working week back. It was a baptism of fire going back to work after having three weeks off over Christmas and into the new year, like in a good way, but still very much like quite intense. This was perfect for that. This is, as I mentioned, I think Tess Gerritsen's The Spy Coast. This is the first in a new series from Tess Gerritsen based around retired spies. And I have been a fan of Tess Gerritsen, frankly, ever since I got back into reading. And she is partly to thank for that because, well, my friend Polly is firstly to thank for that, as Polly bought me a copy of Tess Gerritsen's The Surgeon and Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca when I was going into hospital to have an operation. I didn't pick up The Surgeon, funnily enough, because it's about a psychopathic surgeon. What were you thinking, Polly? I read Rebecca and that got me right back in. And then I headed to the surgeon, completely different, obviously, but really gripped me, had me hooked. And that was the start of a love of the Risley and Isles series that Tess Garrison writes. So I've been a fan for ages, but I haven't read one for quite a while. And this has reminded me, I must go back to some of my favourite crime and thriller writers and also just get more of those sort of books in my reading diet. Because when I love them, I love them. And despite this being, as I mentioned, a read that I had during a really stressful week, this was the perfect escapist book because you get really involved but the way that Tess writes it is quite short, sharp chapters. And so we meet Maggie, who is a, well, first of all, actually, we meet a woman who's on the run from Paris. We don't know why, but then we head to Maine and we meet Maggie, who is a retired spy. And one day there is a dead woman found on her drive, a woman who was looking for another woman called, actually I'm not gonna say anymore, but she's looking for another woman. And does Maggie, or does Maggie not know who this woman was and why she was being hunted? And does this mean she's now in danger? And we then go back to one of Maggie's earlier cases. And she has a few friends who are also retired spies living nearby who help her to work out what is going on. And as I said, it's going to be a new series. I thought this was great. I there was, I was slightly worried with it being a spy novel and being around sort of federal agents and therefore bureaucracy and a little bit of politics. I might be a bit like, uh oh, this could head to Dolesville. And it doesn't because what Tess is very good at is giving you enough of those sort of working admin moments in the spy's life, but along with loads of excitement around it. And I thought that was really, really deftly done. And yeah, I just thought this was a really, really great Oh, I've not been giving them star ratings, have I? Oh, no, I have. Sorry, I should say I'd give that a four. I can't give that one because I've not finished it. I'd give this 3.5. I would give this a solid 4.5. And I had the pleasure of seeing Tess talk about it at Lingham's, which is a bookshop on the Wirral, and then going to have dinner with her because I hadn't seen her for ages. She was one of the first authors I ever interviewed for, like, I don't know if it's on my blog or whether there's an old podcast that I used to. Anyway, she's great. And so is this. So that was fab. Then another DNF, but not forever, just for now. It's The North Water by Ian Maguire, which one of you lovely lot recommended. In fact, now a couple of you have recommended this to me. I was going to Hull for work and this book starts in Hull. And for some reason in January, I was determined that whenever I went away somewhere, I should be reading a book set there. And I don't know if that works for me or not always. I mean, it did with the Heather Darwin, to be fair, and the things we do to our friends. But my problem with this wasn't actually the setting at all. That was great. There were two issues that I was having with this. One, three, actually. One is something that I'm learning about myself as a reader. I 
need to be quite into a book before I'm reading it on a train journey. If I've not started and got a little way in, I lose my concentration really, really easily. So that's one thing. The second thing <laughs> was that it's set in 1859. Some of the language in here is very of the time and it's really problematic and really certain words just made me feel Ugh. I guess that's the point and I guess if you're writing about that time you use language but there was also part of me thinking this is a contemporary author writing to a contemporary audience who know it's a historical novel so actually could you not get rid of that that's a whole question that maybe is something we could talk about in another video maybe I don't know I'd love your thoughts on that down below in the comments in the interim and then the other issue I had was that there is a real odious villainous character at the start but my issue became that I felt it was slightly lazy stereotyping in the fact that he's a horrible man he's gay and basically attacks young men and that is something that is such an odious trope that needs to be nicked in the bud it just bothered me and I can't decide if I was just I hadn't quite got into it and I but those two things just made me go mm, I'm not sure this book is for me I think it's just for now. I'm not sure. If you've read it without giving any spoilers, could you please, please, please let me know in the comments down below? And if it becomes more of a thing and I shouldn't bother, or if actually that's the time it's mentioned and then we go on and yeah, that I would like to know. Thank you very much in advance. On to some poetry, more poetry. The first of two collections that I read uh, back to back. Um, the, this is sometimes Oh no, it's really hard to read this title backwards on a screen when I'm filming, looking at myself. Sometimes I'm so happy I'm not safe on the streets by Dean Wilson. I picked this up in Wrecking Ball, which is a record and bookshop in Hull and also the home of Wrecking Ball Press, who published this book. And this is a brilliant, quirky, daft in the best way, gritty, northern, queer, fabulous collection of poems. I bought both Dean's poetry collections. I was going to read the next one straight away, but I didn't because I was like, no, I need to savour it and have one to head to. But I just loved this. It made me laugh. I found some of them really emotional and it was just such a treat. I also think that cover is fit. There we go. I've said it. Fit, fit, fitty muck, fit. This is just a joy from start to finish. And like I said, it's funny, it's poignant, it's daft in the best ways, it's gritty, it's northern, it's all the things I like. That was great. As was the next poetry collection, which I read between some short stories that we'll come to shortly. So I didn't actually read these quite back to back, but I guess they're the next books that I finished back to back. I've started to do something which is mildly pretentious, I won't lie, but that is to read a poetry collection in the bath and the first collection I did that with was Greekling by Kostya Zolkus and I thought this was phenomenal. I love books that look at cultures when they come together and how they merge, how they riff, how they collide, how they sometimes uh, draw away from each other and or the, how they clash and this is very much that in the case of both Greek culture and I guess English culture but also Greek culture and queer culture and the way those things are looked at in here I thought was fantastic plus it's a book that's very much about um the sort of queer obsession with the body there's one poem particularly that I really really loved which is about having your boyfriend that's based oh, marble boyfriend or marble bf which is about like a boyfriend who's basically like a statue and has this incredible body but sort of is quite aloof or just vacant and and that I thought the way it looked at how quite a lot of gay men not this one is a bear but <laughs> they are obsessed with um just like getting really muscly and really like hench and that I thought was really really interesting and it was very different to to see that I also love there's a poem in here about having a wonky nose and how sometimes our physical heritage um, can define us, can 
be a stereotype that's used against us, but I just loved that as well. So lots of brilliant poems within him. And ultimately, I read Local Fires by Joshua Jones, a short story collection set in one town in Llanelli, Llanethly. I always say it wrong. Llanethly, I think is right. This collection is up for the Dylan Thomas Prize. I had heard of most of the books on the long list. I hadn't heard of this. And when I see a long list and there's a book on it, I don't know. That's the one that I tend to want to go to, as I did with this. I thought this was brilliant. It's a really fascinating look at a town that is trying to stay true to itself, move on from the past, celebrate and acknowledge its past, but try and put itself into the future, but not quite able to keep up with itself, even though a lot of the people within it and within the community are. And um, we go through the, I was going to say like doorways and peek behind the net curtains, basically, of lots of people within this town and some of them appear again in other people's stories but we just get such an incredible insight into a whole wonderful spectrum of characters and their situations there's a story in here about an autistic diagnosis or a diagnosis of, a diagnosis of autism sorry that i thought was so brilliantly done and just is probably the most visceral description of what it's like to be autistic that I've read. Joshua Jones is neurodivergent and queer. There are some great queer stories in here too. But also there's some brilliant stories around all sorts of heterosexual people. I mean, imagine. But that's what I really like, because I think in my head, before I started it, I was a bit like, oh, I am expecting all of these stories to be queer or neurodivergent, and they weren't. And then I was like, oh, but then I was like, that's the way it should be. Anyway, if you've not heard of it, get your mitts on it. If you have heard of it, because you've seen it on the Dylan Thomas Prize, but been like, mm, I'm not sure, get your mitts on it. I would give this a solid 4.5 out of 5. Sorry, I'd give this a solid 4. I would give this, I think, a 5 out of 5. I might need to change my story graph rating of that one. Last but not least, the other five-star book of January was Pity by Andrew McMillan. And I will say, these two books really talk to each other. I talk about them in my latest reading journal, vlog 2, which I'll link down below along with my Edinburgh one so that you can find out more. But this is about a group of men in Barnsley in Northern England. We start off with a quite tricky <laughs> opening segment in many ways of two brothers, Alex and Brian, who we then follow at later points and see Brian when he's working with a group of academics who want to capture the sense of place and the history and the future of the town, like I was saying bit like this. Then we have Alex who's kind of a bit more of a shadowy figure and we get to know slowly but surely as it goes on and find out his story which I found heartbreaking but also hopeful and beautiful which I was really really just about. We meet Alex's son Simon, great name, who is working in a call centre but also as a drag queen and has his own only fan site and he's with Ryan who is a security guard at the local shopping centre who is watching him and Simon's meetings on repeat and there's a lot in here about being watched, voyeurism, knowing you're being watched and performing to an audience but also how we are as humans different people in the eyes of different people but also in the eyes of ourselves depending on what mood we're in. I thought that was all incredible. It was so different in the way that it's like vignette and a bit of a patchwork you have to put it all together and there's really different sort of styles of writing within here which I loved so there's for example there's the surveillance sections with Ryan which is very much about like watching either himself or other people then you have uh, field notes which is what the academics are working on which gives you history of the town but also kind of looks at how the town has stayed the same tried to change can't move forward because of a tragedy that we find out more and more about as we go on then there's this beautiful poetic section which is about the miners. I just thought this was utterly phenomenal. I can't say it. Phenomenal. I feel like I would like to give this a video all of its own. If you would like that, let me know in the comments down below. Or if now that I've talked about your life, whatever you've talked about in two vlogs now, so I really will be hearing about it again because I'm sure this is going to be one of my favourites of the entire year. So there we go. This is a longer video than I expected. And what I want to do going forward, as I mentioned, is do something a little bit different. And that is to put a second or two 
of each day throughout the month that I have wrapped up so that you get like these snapshots, but very, very short. And sadly, my snapshots channel, I think is gonna disappear. I haven't done it for ages. But if you'd like more snapshots throughout the month, as I said, I'm now doing the reading journal vlogs. And I would really, really, really love you to watch them if you haven't, that would mean a lot to me. Those of you who haven't, said lovely things, that really, really means a lot. They, for me, are just a creative joy they're quite full on to edit, but they are a joy. But what I will now do is leave you with, as I said, those snapshots. I hope you enjoy them. I hope you're all doing super duper well. Let me know if you've read any of the books that I've talked about. Let me know what books you read in January and loved, didn't love, DNF, all those things. And I will see you in another video very, very soon. Happy New Year! Wow. Hello, big fish. Hello, How do you feel about saying goodbye to the tree? It's Oscar approved. You can fuck off. She's a star. The completely life changing, unforgettable experience. The stresses of, of retirement, of getting older, especially as a woman.